Good morning and welcome to Southern Maine Healthcare's Medically Speaking. I'm your host, Robert Erickson, and for the next 30 minutes, you'll hear about medical issues and topics of the day directly from leading medical professionals at Southern Maine Healthcare. My guest today is podiatrist Christopher Toth of SMHC Podiatry. Dr. Toth is on hand to discuss foot care for diabetics. Welcome, Dr. Toth. Thank you. Well, we like to start the show off by finding out a little bit about our guests. How did you get involved in medicine, and did you always know that this was going to be your career? Well, I was always, I always knew I was interested in science and biology, and, and I always thought I was going to go into medicine, um, and really didn't know what I was going to do until I met someone in college who was doing podiatry, and I, what I loved about it was that it's so self-contained. You can be very intimate with the patients and basically treat any ailment that they have, so very little cross-referral. So if it's very simple foot care, I can do that. If it's, you know, a little bit of diagnosis that's medical, I can do that. And if it's surgical, I can always just do that as well. So it was a, just a really nice profession where you can kind of encompass the whole patient care. What sort of surgeries do you do as a podiatrist? Uh, the most common uh, surgeries would be uh, things like hammer toes and bunions, which are just sort of congenital uh, contractures of the foot, whether you're a child or whether you're grown up or whether you're diabetic or healthy. Uh, these things happen um, as you get older. And um, those are probably the most common things that I do. There's also injury care, and uh, I frequently do those as well. Now, I think one of the interesting things about the feet is that it's uh, people don't really think about it that much, and it's it's uh, but it's a very important part of the body, of course. And do you see new trends happening? Uh, for instance, uh, more people are running now. Do you see trends of that nature? Yeah, I mean, it's always it's always changing, um, especially when you mentioned the running, the whole barefoot running craze came along and, and, and it kind of hit you by storm because you start getting really busy and uh, you don't, well, what's going on? And then you see the bare, barefoot running people and then you have to educate them. But the most common things that I, I usually see really, really vary. I mean, people come in with foot pain for so many different reasons, which is why podiatry for me is so exciting because it could be, you know, diabetic nerve pain, it could be a child injuring it, could be an ingrown nail, it could be a whole host of things. I see a ton of roofers that come in with nails in their feet. So um, it's a fun profession and it, you know, it, it usually is very exciting. But as far as the most common stuff that I do, it's hard to say because you know, that's what I love about my job. It is, so, it is so varied in itself. Would you say people in general in our society take poor care of their feet? No, I, w- I wouldn't say that. I would say they take it for granted. It's kind of like eyes. My friend's an ophthalmologist. And so you know, when you can't see well, you realize you can't see well. And it's, it's a huge, it affects your life in a big way. And same with your feet. If you can't walk comfortably, it, it really affects you and, and it can humble you because you can't do the things that you could do previously. And uh, people usually are pretty motivated to come see me. Do you see elderly people these days who have excellent looking feet? I mean, or is that something, is that a part of the body that naturally the aging process takes its toll? That's a really interesting question. I've actually never heard that one, but it's, it's no, uh, I, I would say it's, it's funny. I mean, I'm, I'm 44 now. And so as I get older, it's funny, I always look at the birthdays of my patients sometimes to sort of compare and contrast. You know, we do that. um, And uh, I see plenty of people that are in their 90s, and they're doing absolutely fine. And my happiest visit is when someone comes in from a referral from an internist or a family doctor or a fellow orthopedic guy or, or whoever refers. And then I look at them, and they're doing absolutely fine. Um, and that's, that's great. I, you know, we have a nice chat and they leave the room and then we, you know, we, we bid our farewells. And then there's a person that comes in that's, you know, twice as young as myself and, and, and lives a rather unhealthy lifestyle and is possibly also diabetic. And, and, and that's the sad part where, you know, there are so many things about what I do that are preventable that uh, it's, 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 I would say that's the hardest part of my profession is the frustration of trying to educate patients and, and having them sometimes not, uh, not listen as attentively as they should. Well, our main topic today is diabetic foot care, and I don't, I don't think most people don't automatically think of diabetes as affecting the feet in a major way. Explain to our audience a, a little bit about diabetes and how it affects the feet. Well, interestingly enough, I just spoke at the American Academy of Sports Medicine uh, down in Providence, and I spoke with a man called Charlie Campbell, who is a Formula One uh, uh, car racer, and he's the only one that has diabetes. And so I spent quite a bit of time with him, and it's really interesting because in his car, he's got all the stats like the oil pressure, the brake pressure, the heating of the engine, and his glucose right there. So his pit crew, you can hear him kind of monitoring his glucose, and it's, it's fascinating. And what he said, which I really I took to heart, is that he didn't realize how lucky he was to have diabetes because it made him realize all the other things in his life that he had to kind of take control of. So every patient's different. And when I talk to people about diabetes, it's, it's difficult to educate them because a lot of it has to do with your personality. 
And so the people that do very successfully manage their sugars and stay away from problems are the ones that really take it on as a challenge and understand the process. Uh, but the process is complicated, so it's not easy to explain. Essentially, the sugar, you consume the sugar, your body doesn't metabolize it, and certain things happen to your body to degrade the fact that it can't metabolize the sugar. And one of the things that is particular to podiatry is that the nerves start to degenerate. And you can argue, you know, physicians can argue this forever on how it degenerates, but it, for this purpose, it's, it's, it's not important. It degenerates, and so you lose the ability to feel very tiny motor skills, and you lose the ability to feel hot and cold. So what's important about it is that you could possibly have something in your shoe and you don't even know it. And sort of the most kind of glaring example that I remember, my first job in Maine was in, up in the Indian Reservation in the Penobscot Nation, and there was a gentleman that had his grandson's uh, toy car in a shoe for about a week. And he came in with a toy car embedded within his foot and had no idea. And so, yeah, it was, it was, it was quite interesting. And then once we took it out... He kind of, it was right in front of his face that something had to be done. But a lot of times it's not that, you know, not that blatant, not that glaring. And it takes a lot more finesse to explain what's going on. So obviously there's a loss of sensation in the feet uh, brought on by diabetes. What causes that loss of feeling? Well, what, what, what people are hypothesizing, no one really knows actually. If I, if I could tell you, I would be lecturing in a lot of places. But essentially, the, the, the glucose that you take in, the sugar becomes metabolized into, a, into a, a compound called sorbitol. And so everything in your body is, 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 is um, ruled by osmolarity, which is fluids going in and out of different areas. And if the, if the concentration of the sugar is high in the nerve, um, then water wants to follow where the nerve goes, and it swells the compartment. So the nerve is essentially crushed within itself. That's sort of the, the leading theory. There's others out there. And if you ever, you know, hear a medical conference, then there's a whole bunch of doctors yelling at each other. But that's essentially what people think is the problem. But it's on a microscopic level. So these are very, very small nerves, not large nerves. And they're nerves that innervate your organs. They innervate your feet, your sensation. They innervate your kidneys. So, you know, this is where all the kidney shutdown comes from and, 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 and different sort of organ failure type, type things is that just so the general neuropathy of the structures in your body. So if you have diabetes, what, what are the warning signs that would, uh, that would come up? Sometimes it doesn't show up in your feet, but um, you can have these very, very painful calluses um, that you think are calluses, but there's actually an ulcer and an open wound underneath. And so your body hasn't yet broken down the skin. Um, so in the beginning, it almost looks like a warning sign that you have calluses in certain very easily you know, diagnosed pattern areas. So I look at someone's foot and immediately within you know, two or three seconds, I know whether they're neuropathic just from the patterns that the calluses form. So the treatment can be easy as just shaving the calluses and giving the patient a lecture about good, you know, diabetic foot care and, and monitoring their sugar to, you know, shaving the calluses down and realizing that it goes straight to the joint and then it's, it's to the operating room almost immediately. Now, are people who have diabetes and have foot problems, are they generally overweight or is that not necessarily a prerequisite? I see more people that are overweight than not, but diabetes doesn't, by its nature, create a heavy state. So there's plenty of people that are diabetic that also drink alcohol more than they should. And alcohol is a very powerful sugar that gets metabolized in your body. So people don't think of what they eat as being sugar. Uh, I also worked in Georgia. They eat a lot of cornbread down there. So I remember a ton of diabetics just, uh, you know, telling me what they're eating. And I'm just looking at them going, that's all sugar. That's all you're eating is sugar. So obviously a lot of this has to do with lifestyle and diet. And that, that must be very difficult when you have to you have to talk to the patients about lifestyle changes. Right, right. And for me, a lot of it, unfortunately, is, is, is scare tactics. So they come in, and then you have the typical patterns on the foot, and, and they have the open ulcer that they see. And they're very frightened because almost every diabetic that's been diabetic for a long time has had a friend that lost a toe or lost a foot. And so they always bring that up. And I try to downplay it a little, but on the back of my mind, I kind of do talk about that because sometimes fear is a great promoter for better, healthy lifestyle. Uh, but I think my greatest uh, asset is the people that I work with, the internists and the family practitioners and the, you know, the, the people that work with diabetic lifestyle and their, their general medical conditions. So uh, almost every single time, if I have someone that is not controlled diabetic, if their sugars are out of control, uh, or if I'm doing surgery on them and the surgery can't be completed because their sugar is so high, I, uh, I always send them back to their primary care doctor and, and have them you know, go through a whole battery of tests. And, and that usually is, is, is what does, you know, the greatest good for them. 
Well, it sounds like that the healing process after a surgery might be a, a big problem. How do you how do you deal with the healing process? Well, that's that's also funny. Um, it it it. It, a lot of times, just like when you said that if someone is, is, is elderly, you know, their feet can be, uh, you know, do the feet naturally degrade? Well, just because someone's diabetic doesn't mean that they heal poorly. So uh, that is something I've learned from experience and just from doing this long enough is that I can, I can tell pretty quickly whether or not if, if, if this patient is diabetic and they monitor their sugars relatively closely, they usually don't have a problem healing. Uh, some of them do. And it could be from the fact that a lot of diabetics have immunopathy, so that the immunology is also something that gets degraded with uh, chronic diabetes. So it's very difficult to tell. But the healing process is definitely slower for, for diabetics, and I just plan for it. I, I talk to them about the fact that they're going to heal a little slower, and we have a wonderful wound clinic here that, that can manage that as well. So there's a lot of good people that I can refer things to if I feel like uh, the wounds are healing slowly. So walk us through the, the treatment process. Let's say you have a, cl- a client who comes in, and they have diabetes, and they are having foot issues. Let's say they have an ulcer on their foot. What's the process you go through to treat them? Well, the first thing I do is to manage the, you know, what, the, what, what kind of shoe that they're wearing. So I look at what they want to be wearing. And that is actually probably the most frustrating thing that I deal with is usually women, unfortunately, they want to look good. And uh, they're usually, um, you know, either they want to be, you know, going somewhere on a Saturday or Sunday, and they're clearly wearing shoes that are too tight and too fashionable for feet that are that are at risk for ulcerating. And so that's the first thing that I try to address is, is trying to change the foot gear. If they're coming into the office and they have an open ulcer like what you just described, then it's almost critical because if it's not managed, um, there's a window of time where things can be stabilized. If that window of time has gone too long, um, unfortunately, then it becomes an operative problem. So we start off very, you know, very simply by cleaning the wound, debriding the wound with sharp instruments, and making it as, as, as palatable for healing as we possibly can. And then we all cross our fingers. You know, I, I get the primary care and internists involved and maybe nutrition involved so that you can get the biggest advantage for wound care. But you just essentially, sometimes it's just a wait and see. And people that you don't think are going to heal well will surprise you. And people that you think you have all the confidence in the world in end up not healing well. So a lot of it is just uh, up to what the patient does at home. So let's talk a little bit about shoes. Obviously, maybe especially with women, they're wearing shoes to be fashionable, high heels. They're they're cramming their feet at odd angles into these shoes. Do you see a lot of damage from that type of activity? Uh, sometimes I do. And I mean, it, it's funny. I've worked in all over the United States and even in Europe. So lifestyle is definitely different in Maine than it is in, let's say, Budapest or in Toronto or Montreal. So people are tend to dress a little bit more you know, sensibly here. The weather is cold and they're not running around in, in, in flimsy shoes, you know, for they're only doing that for about two months. So I don't see a lot of that. But what I do see is, like I said, people that are at risk that want to be wearing shoes that they shouldn't be wearing. And that's where the education takes place. And, and just like I refer a lot, uh, most of my patients, if not all, that are diabetic to their family doctor, I have a, a prosthetist and an orthotist that comes to the office. And they're really skilled at, uh, at, 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 at talking to, you know, my patients and, and, and being a little bit more, I wouldn't say kind, but just more patient than I am when I see them, you know, and, and they do a better job of maybe, you know, making a compromise between what they want to be wearing uh, and what they should be wearing. Uh, they have access to, you know, inserts and shoes that, that I may not know about. And so that's been helpful in my practice, too. You're listening to Southern Maine Healthcare's Medically Speaking with Robert Erickson. My guest today is podiatrist Christopher Toth of SMHC Podiatry. And we'll be right back after this quick message from SMHC. Not every boo-boo is an emergency, but it still feels like one. That's why Southern Maine Healthcare offers walk-in care. You'll find compassionate care at wonderfully convenient locations. Open seven days a week, no appointment necessary. For those times when the unexpected happens, or you're just not feeling great. Look for the orange ball as your sign of the best walk-in care. In Kennebunk, Saco, Waterboro, and Sanford, Southern Maine Healthcare, a member of Maine Health. And we're back with Dr. Christopher Toth from SMHC Podiatry. So when you see your patients and you're examining their feet, what, what sort of things do you look for? What, what trouble signs do you look for? A lot of times you have someone come in and they, you, know, you don't think that they're at risk, but they're sitting in a chair. So the first thing that I usually do is I watch them walk. So I've got a long hallway, and I, I tell them to roll up their pants and take their socks off and shoes, and I have them walk down a runway. And usually I try to tell them to walk normally, but of course everybody's self-conscious, so they don't. But 
Uh, it's the first thing that you can sort of see. You, you see patterns of how they walk and what shoes they're wearing and, and where the patterns of wear are on their feet. And that's not difficult to do. It only takes a few minutes, but it makes all the difference in the world. So I usually get a pretty good idea of how someone's foot's working by actually just watching them walk. And I don't think any other practitioner out there does that. So it's kind of unique to my field. So besides diabetes patients, what, what sort of uh, problems do you look for? I mean, when you see a patient walk, is it uh, bulges or angles of the feet? What, what kind of things do you look for? I remember from my, you know, my school training, there's all sorts of ways you can analyze gait and there's the textbook way of walking and a lot of that your body compensates for. So what I found most, uh, most unusual is, is actually when I watch them walk, I concentrate on their neck and their back. I was a team physician for a ballet for many years here in New England. And so I saw tons of girls uh, with poor posture and poor uh, neck control and poor core strength. And that has a lot to do with how someone uh, is able to walk. So um, you kind of have to take a a very global view about watching them walk. But as far as bulges, and everybody's body eventually compensates to whatever they have. So a lot of times you can look at something, and when I was a young practitioner, I would see something that's out of the normal and get all excited so I can tell them about it. But eventually your body compensates to what's happening. And a bulge that you think might be painful sometimes is not painful. And if you address it and you try to make them walk a certain way that you think they should walk, you can do more harm than good. So you have to work with the patient and find out what their comfort level is. But there are certain signs. I mean, when the foot is flattening out and moving out, if when you know young kids are walking like a dock or, or they're in towing, there are certain things that you can do to help them with that. Uh, but in general, everybody's foot's different and there's, there's no one sort of glaring sign that I look for. Now, a lot of the, for instance, the sports shoe stores these days have ways of, they try to sell you on uh, things that are particular for your gait or your foot angle. It's very scientific. Do you think those have, have value? Well, I think it's better than nothing. So it's, it's, I almost wish I invented them, you know, because so, <laughs> I'm missing out on opportunities. But um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, what, what I do in the office and what my orthotist and prosthetist does is doing a custom-made mold where the patient comes in and gets a complete custom mold so that when they put it in their shoe, it exactly fits to their foot. You know, there's no uh, substitute for something that's made with that quality. However, I do send sometimes people to, you know, get over-the-counter inserts before to see if it would work, because sometimes these orthotics, custom-made ones, are expensive, and I don't want them to waste their money in, in something that may not work. So I don't see any harm in that, but uh, I don't like when they advertise custom-made, because they're not. They're essentially, you know, the, the machine is measuring their feet, and then there's pre-made orthotics on the, on the deck there, and then they just pick whatever they want out. But there's enough people out there that have had temporary relief that I'm not going to, I'm not going to knock it. So anything that, that they're trying to do to better them, their comfort is, is fine with me. Now, general foot care, uh, of course, the Chinese felt in Chinese medicine that the, uh, the health of the body sort of started with the foot. How do you see the, the foot affecting the rest of the body? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And I'll go back to the, the, the ballet. What my job was to, to figure out which girls are able to go on point because of the strength in their feet or the strength in their calves. And uh, so they hired me as a hatchet man, sort of, so that when when I make the decision, the uh, the trainers and the dance instructors don't get blamed from the parents that go crazy because they want their daughters on point. So I would go in there, and and after about doing it for three or four years, what I realized was it had actually very little to do with foot strength and flexibility. It was all core strength, and it was all back position, and it was all spinal position. So one thing that I've done uh, pretty commonly is if I suspect that there is something with the, with, with, with the spine or the neck or, or, or core strength, a lot of times I'll send, uh, especially the kids, to either neurology or a spine specialist and, and have them examined before I make an orthotic or before I do anything surgical or before I, I even start to treat them because so much of, of what happens in the foot comes from the top down. And it's very tempting for someone like me that studied the foot for my whole life to think that everything emanates from the foot if the foot hurts. But the reality is, is that there's so much that goes the opposite way, where it comes from the neck and the head down. When you were in medical school, did you learn anything about the foot that surprised you? Yeah, I mean, per, per I guess, percentage area of the body, the foot has the most amount of bones. So we were always very proud of that. You know, we're you know, doing you know, the, the surgery on the body that has the most amount of bones. What surprised me the most, and, and I, it still frustrates me to this day, 
is that I've never understood that when I do surgery on, 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 on someone's foot, that they'll walk on it right after. It's amazing. So the issue of non-compliance is huge, and I never really realized that. So that's one thing that after doing it for so many years, um, when I do my operative planning, I really stress the importance of not walking on it because I, I can't take anything for granted. And especially when I worked my first job working up at the Indian Reservation up in, up in northern Maine, the things that I saw these people doing, like working on the farm right after foot surgery, was amazing. So I just... Uh, I never underestimate people's ability to walk on the foot after surgery, and my, I guess, educating the patient has become much more important. So I suppose that's really surprised me. So getting back to diabetic foot care for a moment, how often should a person with diabetes have their feet checked? Well, that's extremely variable, but I'll, you know, on average, I like to see people that is a diabetics that are at a moderate risk at least every two or three months for a, for a, for a check. Some people come in and they're really in a tough spot, and there's a lot of risk factors in their feet, whether they have open sores or they have hammer toes, and the nails are getting infected. Then I have them come back more more frequently until I can get them stabilized, and then they come back, uh, you know, every two or three months. But when they come in, I always give the same same talk to you know almost everyone that comes in for diabetic foot care, and I just stress to them doing a foot check every single night, you know, to purchase a mirror and to see the bottom of their feet, make sure they don't see any changes because uh, it's really important to monitor what's going on. Like I said before, the gentleman that stepped on the, uh, the, the kid's toy and was basically walking around with a toy in his foot, it was amazing, but he didn't know it because he didn't see it and he didn't feel it. So as far as nail care, uh, that's something that I do pretty commonly is I cut people's nails that are diabetic because if they do it at home and they cut themselves, then that can arise a lot of problems so they can, they can get infected a lot. Um, but as far as the frequency of the visits, I usually gauge it with the patient, but on an average, every, it's every two to three months. So if someone has a primary care physician and they feel like they need to see a podiatrist, do they go to their primary care physician first or can they just contact you directly? Yeah, we are always very happy to see people if they call. And, and I would say half the people come from the street and they call because they're concerned. Um, and then the other half are automatically referred. So I, there's a number of podiatrists in this health system that automatically they have a diabetic and they refer them to um, an ophthalmologist for eye care because a lot of diabetes have eye, uh, patients have eye problems. And then they send them to a podiatrist immediately. So at least I can do a baseline. So I'm hoping the culture changes in that, you know, when someone goes to a doctor automatically, if they're diabetic, they automatically get referred. But it's, it doesn't always happen. So if a patient is diabetic, it, it, it would be a really good idea to at least get a baseline check, even if you think you have no risk factors whatsoever. Now, you've mentioned that people should do self-exams, whether uh, if you have, especially if you have diabetes, but even just the regular aging process, older people might have neuropathy or a numbness of the toes. What what should people be looking for during that kind of self exam? Um, I can tell you that the most common complaint I get with neuropathy is pain in the evening. So if you if there's burning or tingling or or you feel like your foot feels heavy, um, that sometimes can mean that you know you're not feeling your feet. If you're tripping, if you feel unstable, it means that the nerves on your feet aren't working, so you can't feel your foot hit the ground. But you know. When you feel those things, it's almost like, it's not that it's too late, but the neuropathy has already happened and it needs to be dealt with. The problem comes when it's sort of on the borderline in the beginning where people just don't know. So it's a difficult thing to answer because the easiest way to figure that out is to come to my office and I can do tests that I can essentially tell you if you have neuropathy. And plenty of times people don't uh, don't know they have it. So it sounds like diabetics in particular need to be very careful about their foot care. Yeah, they do. I mean, the, 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 the most common people that I see that have neuropathy are obviously diabetics is a huge population. Uh, spinal injury patients are another one that are sometimes unrecognized, people that have spinal injuries. And people that have had a history of alcoholism that, that uh, drink a lot of alcohol, they all present very similar ways. So if any, any patients have those, you know, those types of uh, problems in the past or the present, they can usually benefit from a foot check. So if we have someone listening in our audience who, ha- who has diabetes and would like to uh, explore some of these treatments, what, what kind of things do you offer th- those patients? Yeah, for diabetes, if, they're, if they feel uncomfortable uh, or if they're at risk for uh, infection, depending upon what stage of the diabetes they're in or, or, or their comfort level, uh, regular foot care is easily done. That's probably the, mo- the easiest thing that I do in my office, and it's done very quickly. If there's calluses, I take care of it. Um, if the nails are long and ingrown, I manage that. Um, and I just basically make sure that their foot's doing okay. So uh, just regular foot checks are the most important thing.
So for people who have diabetes, what what sort of things can they do to prevent infection? Uh, The easiest thing to do is to be wearing shoes that aren't going to rub rub up against the bony prominences of the foot, leading a healthy uh, lifestyle, eating a a very healthy diet so that your immune system works well and and your healing systems work well, Um, exercising so uh, your cardiovascular status is working well, so you're not getting uh, swelling of the legs and vein problems, and just pretty much leading a healthy lifestyle, I think, makes the biggest difference. I see a lot of patients that are overweight. And that's, you know, that definitely contributes to foot problems because if you're carrying a lot of weight, it's going to affect your feet the most. Uh, Your feet carry all the weight in your body. So um, lifestyle changes like diet changes and exercise are usually um, an amazing thing to do because it manages the weight and it manages the diabetes at the same time. Do do you have a story you could tell us about a, uh, a patient maybe who came in and was feeling kind of helpless about their, their feet and you were able to give them some relief and help them out? Yeah, I, I have actually quite a few, and they're, they're all good memories. But it, it, sometimes it's very emotional. I had a gentleman just uh, probably a month ago that has a long history of di- uh, diabetes, and um, he had previously lost a few digits on his other foot. And so he came in with some wounds and ulcers to his other foot. And so he was very scared about losing more digits. And so what we did was we just took a very, very uh, systematic approach. Uh, the first thing I did was to get him in touch with a, you know, he didn't even have a primary care doctor. So he got a family doctor, managed his sugars. Uh, we cleaned up his wounds. Uh, eventually, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that in the end, you know, his foot was saved. The bad news is I did have to do some surgery on him, but the whole process was rather smooth and he ended up healing very, very well. Um, and there was a lot of collaboration with the wound care center, and there was a lot of collaboration with a lot of other care providers. So um, he was well cared for. Um, but those are the stories that are success stories, and usually it happens from a patient that is, is, is self-motivated. And so that's what you know everyone in the system tries to do, is to try to you know, have people uh, understand their situation and, and, and make it better. You've mentioned a couple of times the wound care center here at Southern Maine Healthcare. Uh, it sounds like you work as a team effort. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, they, um, they, we send patients back and forth, and, 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 and um, you know, whenever I have a wound that uh, is very difficult, um, you have to use a lot of fancy products that you don't always have in the office. So they have access to that, and they, they, you know, that's what they see every day. So they've been a great resource to, to send people to when, when, when what I'm doing, and it's not that it's not working, it's just the body's not responding to it, and maybe another product might help. I know it's different for every patient, obviously, but is there, do these, how long do these treatments take? Does it, is it a lengthy process for a lot of these patients? It can be. It can be, especially if, if, if the structure, if the wound is on the heel, um, that takes a very long time to heal. And uh, it, a lot of it has to do with the blood supply as well. So if you can imagine a, a patient that is diabetic and, and maybe generally unhealthy, their blood supply is very poor. So a lot of times we're all very nervous waiting for the wound to heal because if it takes too long, um, then other measures have to be taken to, to take care of the situation. So a lot of, sometimes it is, it's nerve wracking just waiting for, for someone to turn in a positive direction. And we don't like admitting people to the hospital. We don't like them sitting around in a room. So we want them to be in, you know, outside and in their home and, and, and trying to be active. So we try to you know, do what we can to heal up the wounds as fast as possible. Are there new treatments for diabetic foot care that maybe have come online in the last five years? Yeah, well, there's an amazing amount of treatments, actually. I was just in a conference in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, the World Diabetic Congress Conference, and it was amazing. There's so much technology out there, and I'm actually meeting with someone in uh, Boston next week, and their technology is they've developed an insert that, 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 that connects to a smart smartwatch that basically tells you what pre- where your pressures are, the averages, and where your risks are. It's as simple as a, you know, a red light comes up when you're putting too much pressure in one area. So if a patient can't feel their feet, it's huge. It's, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, that makes all the difference. There's other you know, things like glucose embedded monitors and, 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 and things that measure your sugar, like Charlie Kimball has, where it gives you real-time wireless Bluetooth connectivity. So it's just it's incredible, the, 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 the technology out there. And just the shoe technology is really good. Shoes used to last maybe three or four months, and now you can get a shoe that's well-made for a diabetic and then change the inserts instead. So there's a lot of things out there that, you know, if you're not in the business, you don't know. So So there's a lot of value I can add to patients by steering them in the right direction. Now, are there any resources that you recommend for our listeners if they want to find out more about diabetic foot care or just general questions about uh, podiatry? 
Yeah, the American Podiatric Medical Association has a very good uh, web page, um, and you can go on their site. The American Diabetes Association that I'm connected with also has a very good web page. If you click Foot Health, there's a lot of good advice, and I've looked at most of it, and a lot of it is good advice. I mean, the web is kind of a tricky thing. I have patients, a lot of my patients come in pre-diagnosing themselves, and, and so a lot of my time is spent sort of correcting them what they diagnose. But for foot care and for uh, general diabetes care, there's actually really good resources. Even the hospital has a good resource for that. So, But there's no substitute in coming to see someone like me and having me you know, put my eyes on it, my hands on it, and, and essentially do a quick evaluation. And if someone wants to reach you personally in your office, what is, what is the easiest way for them to do that? Well, I'll give you the phone number um, uh, on the radio, and here it is. It's uh, 207-294-8230. And uh, we're actually moving our uh, practice to the new uh, Edward J. McGeechee building um, in Biddeford. So I'll be in with uh, neurology and orthopedics and internal medicine is upstairs. So there's a lot of access to, you know, other specialists there as well. Well, we've run out of time for this week. My guest today has been podiatrist Christopher Toth of SMHC Podiatry. Dr. Toth, thank you for sharing some time with us. Thank you. Join me next week at this time for a new guest and an enlightening discussion about health care in our communities. Brought to you exclusively by Southern Maine Healthcare, your trusted resource for healthcare in Southern Maine.